tonight is Dr. Beatrice Doran. Beatrice is a dog. She was ed educated in Muckras and UCD. She has worked all her life as a librarian, mostly in academic libraries. And for a while she was the, uh, the, the librarian director in the College of Surgeons. And she has written this very interesting book called From the Grand Canal to the Dother illustrious lives and self-explanatory retelling is about, about all the eminent people that have lived in that corner of Dublin. So a right glad, Beatrice, please. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, President. I'd like to begin by thanking the President of and the Secretary and the Committee of the Nakhlein History Society for inviting me to speak to you this evening. I was delighted to receive the invitation from Aoife Tierney, especially when it emerged during our conversation that I knew her brother Fergus and his wife Maureen when we played tennis together at St. Mary's Tennis Club in Donnybrook on Belmont Villas. I have written two books on Donnybrook and they're both still, uh, uh, and they're both still in, in print. I'm going to talk tonight about a few people who lived in the area that we now call Dublin Four. The area, I couldn't use Dublin Four in the title because of Russell Carroll Kelly and some of the disparaging comments one gets if one says you live in Dublin Four. Over the years, Dublin Four has been home to poets, writers, artists, politicians, academics, including two former winners of the Nobel Prize for Literature, W.B. Yeats and Seamus Heaney, who lived in Sandymount. Two former presidents of Ireland, Sean T. O'Kelly and Eamon de Valera, made their homes in Donnybrook. Three former Lord Mayors of Dublin, Alderman George Rowe, who lived in the 19th century, Alderman Robert Briscoe and Alderman Sean Moore, were also Donnybrook residents. Many distinguished women also lived in the area too. Pamela Travers, the author of Mary Poppins, lived in Upper Leeson Street during the 1960s. Sophie Bryant from Park Avenue in Sandymount was a brilliant mathematician and an educator. Agnes Burnell, the cabaret artist, lived on Strand Road in Sandymount. And Sarah Purser, the portrait painter and stained glass artist, lived in Mespel House overlooking the Grand Canal on Mespa Road. The earliest entry in the book is for Springer Barry, Spranger Barry, an outstanding Irish actor who was celebrated on the London stage during the 18th century, and who I discovered is buried along with his wife in Westminster Abbey. His wife, Anne, was also a great actress. And this is an image of the sculptor on his tomb in Westminster Abbey. I'm often asked who the images are on the cover of my book. The lady on the left is Pamela Travers, who wrote Mary Poppins, and she lived at 69 Upper Leeson Street for about six years. Next is Sir Alfred Chester Beatty, who lived at 10 Aylesbury Road, and he began the Chester Beatty Library on Shrewsbury Road, now located in the grounds of Dublin Castle. Then there's Molly, or Mary Cullum, who was a writer and critic. She and her husband, Podrick Collin, began their married life at number two Belmont Avenue. You'll probably recognize Paddy Kavanagh on the right, who of course is associated with the Grand Canal, where there is a lovely, lovely uh, statue of him on the canal. Kavanagh lived at 62 Pembroke Road, and he also lived on Morehampton Road in Donnybrook with his brother, Peter. Some of you will recognize the Grand Canal. It's looking from Bagot Street Bridge towards Leeson Street Bridge. And this picture is by Pat Totty and it's on the cover of my latest book. This is an image of the River Dodder, which is 26 kilometers, 16 miles long 
and it passes through several areas before it enters the Liffey near Ring's End at the Grand Canal Dock. I want to draw your attention to a woman who lived in this house on uh, Anglesey Road, and I knew very little about her before I started researching this book. I refer to Beatrice Bean, wife of Brendan Bean, who lived most of her life in this house, number five, Anglesey Road. Beatrice was born in Dublin on the 31st of December, 1925, to Cecil French Salkett and his wife, Irma Taisler, who was a native of Berlin. She was educated at Pembroke School or Miss Meredith's, which her daughter Blonet also attended. After finishing school, Beatrice became a student at the National College of Art and Design. She also undertook further study in Italy. Over the years, her paintings were shown at all the major art exhibitions in Ireland and in New York. Here's an image of one of Beatrice's paintings, which her daughter Blonet, who lives in Oxford, sent me. It's a painting done from the front garden of her family home at 43 Morehampton Road, where she grew up. And by the way, the house is beside the bus stop at the bottom of Marlborough Road on the Morehampton Road. Here's another one of Beatrice's paintings, this time of O'Brien's pub near Leeson Street Bridge, a pub which was very popular with both Beatrice and Brendan Bean. When she graduated from the College of Art, Beatrice became a botanical assistant in the National Museum, where she worked for six years. She first met Brendan at her parents' house on Morehampton Road. They were married in February 1955 at the Church of the Sacred Heart, Donnybrook. Brendan didn't tell his family about the wedding, and he turned up at the church with no best man. So Joe Doyle, who was clerk of the church at the time, stood in. You may know that he afterwards became Lord Mayor of Dublin between 1998 and 1999. Brendan bought the family home on Anglesey Road in 1959 for £1,400 for his wife, Beatrice. Beatrice Bean never learned to drive, and she was often seen around Donnybrook on her bicycle. She met her friends frequently in Long's pub in Donnybrook, which is just beside Bechtoff, and included uh, Frankie Byrne, the public relations expert among her friends. After Brendan's death, Beatrice devoted herself to bringing up Blona, their daughter, and her son Podge, whose father was Cottle Goulding. She died at her home on Anglesey Road on the 9th of March, 1993. She's buried in Glasnevin Cemetery along with her husband, Brendan. The house was sold in 2006 for 1.65 million euro, quite an increase from the published, the purchase price of 1,400, I think you'll agree. I had the pleasure of having lunch with the Bean's daughter, Blonet, last summer. Blonet and her husband lived near Oxford and she was in Dublin for her son's graduation at Trinity College. And the son is now a student at the London School of Economics. And it turns out that Bononet is a great swimmer and she actually swims for Ireland. I think it's veteran swimming now at this stage. Since we've been living with the pandemic for so long, of the past two years, I thought you might like to hear about Sir Charles Cameron, who was Dublin's chief medical for officer for health during the flu epidemic of 1918 and 1919. I suppose you could say he was the Tony Houlihan of the day. And he lived at 27 Raglan Road. The Spanish flu, which spread, which swept across the world in 1918 and 1919, killed an estimated 50 to 100 million people. During this time, Charles Cameron was head of public health for Dublin Corporation and its chief medical officer. Though a Protestant, he worked tirelessly to improve the lives of the mainly Catholic Dublin poor who lived in the slums. Cameron introduced some pioneers initiatives to fight the highly infectious diseases that were rampant in Dublin. He established the Pigeon House Isolation Hospital and he provided a special ambulance for fever patients and he also provided free disinfectant to the poor. So who was Sir Charles Cameron? 
Well, that's one of the isolation hospitals in Belfast, actually, not in Dublin. Who was Charles Cameron? He was born in Dublin to a Captain Ewan Cameron, a Scottish soldier, and his cabin wife, Belinda Nia Smith, in 1830. He was always very proud of his Scottish ancestors, as you can see from this picture. He was educated in both Dublin and Guernsey and had an early interest in chemistry. And he became apprentice to an apothecary in Dublin. He then spent time in Germany studying chemistry and on his return, he became a doctor studying at the Apothecary's Hall, which used to be on the corner of Merrion Square, the same side as the National Gallery, the Dublin School of Medicine and the Ledwich School of Medicine. He went on to become a licentiate and a member of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. He also received a diploma in public health from Cambridge University. So I think you will agree he was a very well educated doctor. In 1868, Cameron was appointed to the chair of chemistry and hygiene at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. For 55 years, he was a professor in the college. And while there, he took on some of the more senior posts in Dublin Corporation, including that of city analyst and executive sanitary officer for the city. Food inspection became the focus of his work, and he may also be one of the first to have highlighted the role of shellfish in transmitting typhoid. Cameron became a Freemason in 1859, and the Freemasons honored him by naming one of their lodges, lodges after him. During his lifetime, Cameron received a knighthood, and in 1911, he was made an honorary freeman of the city of Dublin for his great work as chief medical officer. In 1920, he published his autobiography called The Autobiography of Sir Charles A. Cameron. In 1862, Cameron had married Lucy McNamara, and the marriage took place at St. Mary's Church of Ireland on Anglesey Road, which I think is up for sale at the moment. He died on the 27th of February at his home, 27 Ragland Road, and he's buried in Mount Jerome Cemetery. There was a recent biography of him called In the Fever King's Preserve, Sir Charles Cameron and the Dublin Slums by Lydia Carroll, who's a Trinity graduate. To commemorate the centenary of the death of Sir Charles Cameron, the College of Surgeons has launched a new commemorative website highlighting his work and legacy. I now want to move on to talk about a very distinguished Irish artist. She was christened Estella Solomons, but she's more popularly known as Stella. She was an artist and a portrait painter, and she lived for many years at number two, Morehampton Road. She was the daughter of Morris Solomons and his wife, Rosa, and she was born on the 2nd of April, 1882, at their family home, 32 Waterloo Road. Stella was educated at Miss Wade's private school on Morehampton Road in Donnybrook and she spent a year in Hamburg before finishing her education at Alexandra College. When she was 16, she entered and enrolled at the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art, where she studied under such distinguished painters as Walter Osborne and William Orpen. She later spent three years in London at the Chelsea School of Art, and from there she went on to Paris to study. In 1906, Stella began contributing to the annual exhibitions of the Royal Hibernian Academy in Dublin. She joined, she joined Common and Vaughan in 19, about 1918, uh, and she joined the Renella branch of it, and she became active in politics. She supported the Republican side in the Civil War, and her studio was used regularly as a safe house. She also painted a number of their leaders, and Dr. Hilary Pyle, the distinguished art historian, has re reproduced the paintings that survive in a book called Stella Solomon's Portrait of Painters. She began teaching at the Dublin Municipal Technical Schools in the early 1920s and resigned when she refused to take the oath of allegiance to the British Crown. But after the Civil War, Stella withdrew from all her political activities. From about 1911, Seamus O'Sullivan became part of Stella's life. He was a poet and editor of the Dublin magazine, and in 1926, they married. 
Their Sunday afternoon salons were a very popular venue for the Dublin literati, which also included artists and critics. Their house in Rathfarnham was damp, unfortunately, and they feared for the future of their fine library of books. Stella's great friend, Kathleen Goodfellow, was a writer and poet, and she owned a number of properties in Dublin. She offered Stella and Seamus a house that she owned next to her own on Warhampton Road for a nominal rent, and they moved there. And this is an image of the two houses on the Warhampton Road, which is just beyond the junction of Wellington Road and Warhampton Road. It's beside the Grove, a wild wildlife sanctuary. In fact, it's the first two houses, the first two houses on the left-hand side of the road as you head towards Donnybrook. Like many artists of her generation, Stella Solomons was proud to be Irish and was at the center of Irish cultural life for some 50 years. Here is an image of her later in life uh, with her portrait of Jack B. Yeats. Seamus O'Sullivan, Stella's husband, died in 1958 and she herself died on November the 2nd, 1968, at the age of 86. And she chose to be buried in Woodtown Cemetery, Rathfarnham, with her Jewish ancestors. There's been a wonderful Yeats exhibition at the uh, National Gallery, and I just thought you might be interested in the entry in my book uh, about Jack, Jack Yeats. He was born he was born in London on the 29th of August, 1871, to the artist John Butler Yeats and his wife, Susan. His mother's family were a wealthy merchant family in Sligo, and Jack Yeats spent a great deal of his childhood in Sligo and often traveled on his grandfather's ships between Liverpool and Sligo. In 1867, Jack went to London, where he attended several different art schools. And while living in London, he worked as an illustrator for magazines like Boy's Own Paper and Judy. I think my sister used to buy Judy. He also illustrated more than 500 cartoons for Punch between 1910 and 1948 under the pseudonym W. Bird. Jack Yates met Mary Cottenham White, who was a fellow artist in London, and they married in 1894. Yeats and his wife were regular visitors to Ireland, and they contributed designs to the Don Emer Guild, established in Dundrum by Evelyn Leeson and the Yeats sisters in 1902. In 1915, Jack Yeats was elected a member of the Royal High Bear Burning Academy. Perhaps his most famous painting is the uh, is is the lit is the literary. Sorry, perhaps his most famous painting, the literary, the literary Liffey Swim, which is now in the National Gallery. Dr. Vivian Igo has pointed out in her literary guide to Dublin, and I quote, in the autumn of 1917, the couple moved to 61 Marlborough Road in Donnybrook, which was in a less lonely area than their previous house in Greystones and more convenient for them to meet their friends. Unlike his brother, W.B. Yeats, Jack Yates became a nationalist sympathizer. Despite being a painter, Jack Yates had a significant interest in the theater and in literature. He and Samuel Beckett were close friends, as were John Macefield and J.M. Singh. Jack Yates wrote a number of plays for miniature theater, a collection of short stories for children, and several plays and novels, which were published throughout the 1930s and 1940s. Three of his plays, in fact, were produced at the Abbey Theatre. Major collections of Yeats's paintings are to be found in the National Gallery of Ireland and in the Yeats Museum in Sligo. There's also a Jack B. Yeats collection in the Model Art Gallery in Sligo. When his wife died, Jack Yeats moved to Portobello Nursing Home, where he died aged 86 in 1957. He's buried with his wife in Mount Jerome Cemetery in Dublin. Now I want to tell you about a very distinguished Irish woman who spent most of her life in London. Her name was Sophie Bryant and she was born Sophie Will Willock, W-I-L-L-O-C-K, in 1850. She was a mathematician, an educationalist and a suffragette, and the family lived at one time in Park Avenue in Sandymount. She was born in 1850 and her father, Dr. William Willock, was a fellow and tutor in mathematics at Trinity College, 
and her mother was called Sophie Morris. The family lived on a road which was then known as Cottage Park Avenue, but it's now called Park Avenue. I've not been able to identify the exact house because houses were not numbered in those days, but this house on Park Avenue would date from uh, the period that, they, that the family lived there. When the family moved to London, Sophie was only 13. <clears throat> uh, her father was appointed to the chair of geometry, of, as I said, and in 1857, Sophie sat the Cambridge entrance examination and she obtained a first in mathematics. In 1866, she won a scholarship to Bedford College, which was the first of the University of London, or the first level, the first third level college for women only. She married a Dr. William Hicks Bryant in 1869, who was a surgeon, but he died a year later. In 1878, the University of London began admitting women to degree courses. So Sophie became a part-time student and graduated in 1881 with a BSc in mathematics. In 1884, she was the first woman to be awarded a DSC in England. She was also the first woman to have a research, research paper published in the, prestig the prestigious proceedings of the London Mathematical Society. She became a teacher at the North London Collegiate School for Girls in eight, and in 1895, she was appointed headmistress and this school is still in existence. She became the chair of the Teachers' Training Council and was instructing, instruct, instrumental in setting up the Cambridge Training College for Women, now Hughes, Hall, now Hughes Hall at Cambridge University. Sophie had a great interest in Irish politics and was a supporter of Home Rule. She was also a suffragette and was a speaker at both Home Rule and suffragette meet meetings in both England and Ireland. Sophie always retained a great interest and love for, for Ireland. During her lifetime, she wrote three books on Irish history, as well as the article, numerous articles on education. She received an honorary doctorate from Trinity College when it opened its doors to degrees for women in 1904. Sophie was very sporty, which was very unusual for the time. She was a cyclist, a rower, and an experienced mountain climber. She climbed the Mount Matterhorn twice. Very sadly, she disappeared on a climbing holiday in the French Alps in 1922. Her body was found two weeks later, and the cause of her death was assumed to have been a hiking accident. She was 72 years of age. An obituary appeared for in the journal Nature, which described her as, and I quote, a teacher and a pioneer in education, a mathematician, a philosopher, an Irish patriot, and a suffragette. She was a great personality and a splendid friend, a perpetual source of information and joy to all who knew her. I'm now going to talk about Reg Armstrong. Are any of you familiar with this house, I wonder? It was home to Reg Armstrong and his family, and it's near Ashford in County Wicklow. It was built, I gather, about 1820, and I don't really know if it's a family house still or if it's, it's offices. I came across some reference to it being an office at one stage. Harry Reginald Armstrong was born in Dublin to Fred Armstrong and his wife Marjorie. Reg was an only child. He was brought up at the family home in Farnham Park. He was educated at the high school, which was then located in Harcourt Street. His father had an interest in motorcycle racing, which probably led Reg to take up motorcycle racing in his early teens. In September 1947, at the age of 19, Reg made his Isle of Man debut in the Manx Grand Prix lightweight 250cc race, in which he finished fifth, riding an Excelsior. His big break came when team managers began to take notice of him, and over the following years, Reg Armstrong became one of the world's leading motorcycle racers. During his racing career, which concluded at the end of the 1956 season, Reg rode for all the top teams of the time. On retiring from motorbike racing, Reg took up car racing, which he did with limited success over the following 12 years. At the same time, he was also a very successful businessman and building up his business. 
From as early as 1953, his company, Reg Armstrong's Motorcycles, had been assembling NSU machines in Dublin. And by 1958, NSU motorcycles were being produced at his facility here. The same year, Reg was awarded the contract to assemble the new NSU Prince cars in Ireland. I remember the small Prince cars, I'm sure many of you do too. The company expanded and he purchased a 65,000 square foot premise in Rings on the Rings End Road for 30,000 pounds to deal exclusively with car production. The company then acquired the contract to assemble Japanese Honda motorcycles in Dublin. And in 1962, they were approached to assemble and distribute German Opel cars in Ireland. In the mid 1970s, they expanded to assembling the Mini for British Leyland, but soon afterwards, the Irish government allowed the importation of fully assembled cars. Unfortunately, this led to the loss of many highly skilled jobs at, at Reg's Rings End plant. Reg Armstrong was married twice. His first wife was Rosemary Adams from Ballymena. They had two daughters, Julie and Linda. Both daughters now live in England, and I had the pleasure of meeting Julie when I was staying with a friend in Hartford in Hertfordshire two years ago. He and his wife divorced in the 1970s, and she returned to Northern Ireland to live. The two, the two girls were boarders at the Hall School in Monkstown, and they used to spend time with both parents during the holidays. Julie told me. In 1974, Reg married for a second time. This time his wife was Eileen Robins Robertson, who was an Isle of Man opera singer. And she died at the age of 98 in 2017 in Douglas, the Isle of Man. Sadly, in 1979, Reg was killed in his Opel Senator car, which crashed at Kilqueeny near Avoca. He was only 51 years of age. He's buried with his parents in that lovely Church of Ireland graveyard in Enniskerry. Some of you will remember Frankie Byrne and her Jacob sponsored program on RTE radio called Dear Frankie. She was born in Dublin into a very successful family of journalists. Her family lived at two Florence Terrace in Leeson Park. She was educated at the Loretta Abbey in Rathfarnham and after school, she went to work at the Embassy of Brazil in O'Connell Street in Dublin. Later, she moved to McConnell's advertising agency. In 1963, she set up her own PR agency and was the first woman to do so in Ireland. She acquired many big contracts, including the public relations contract for the visit of John F. Kennedy to Ireland in 1963. A shrewd businesswoman, Frankie ran the firm successfully in association with her younger sister, Esther, until her retirement in 1990. One of Frankie's largest contracts was with Jacob's Biscuit Factory. She began hosting an Agony Ant lunchtime program on RTE for Jacob's, which lasted from 1963 to 1965. In this program, she castigated unworthy boyfriends and idle and difficult husbands, in between Frank Sinatra records and ads for Jacob Biscuits. An unhappy private life led Frankie to a life for a time on drink and prescription drugs. However, she eventually kicked the habit and she dropped out of the public eye after, or, after the RTE show was cancelled in 1985. She had a daughter as a result of a long extramarital relationship whom she gave up for adoption, although she didn't meet her in later years. After her RTE program was axed, Frankie continued to organize the annual Jacobs TV and radio awards for years, which were a great success. Frankie had lived most of her life in Donnybrook, off Eglinton Road in a house called Dunbar on Brookfay Road. The house is no longer in existence and I couldn't get a copy. I couldn't find a photograph of it anywhere, but it's now the site of eight terrace houses overlooking the River Dodder just opposite the garage in Donnybrook is, is where it is. In the latter part of her life, she was ill for several years with Alzheimer's disease, and she died on the 11th of September at St. Vincent's Hospital, Elm Park in Dublin, and she's buried in St. Vincent's Cemetery in Sutton. The final person I've chosen to talk about is Alderman George Rowe. 
who lived between 1796 and 1863. He was the owner of Rose Distillery and a former Lord Mayor of Dublin. His main residence was at Nutley on the Stillorgan Road, where he farmed over 100 acres. It's now the home of Elm Park Golf and Sports Club, but the entrance has moved to Nutley Lane. George Rowe was born in Booterstown in 1796, and he married Mary, daughter of Thomas Franklin, at St. Peter's Church in Anger Street in 1819, but this church no longer exists. They have no recorded children, so his heirs became his brothers, brother Henry and Henry's sons, who are also called George and Henry, and this has caused all kinds of confusion over the years. All that remains of the original, oh, and that's when he was Lord Mayor of Dublin, that's his crest on the right, and you can see his, what would you call it, virtue and valour, anyhow, is obviously what he believed in, and the one on the left is that of Daniel O'Connell, and he was Lord Mayor of Dublin between 1842 and 1843. And all that remains of the, um, the brewery, or not the brewery, the, the, the distillery, is St. Patrick's Tower, which was a former stock windmill used to power Rose Distillery. And I mentioned there that Sean Murphy, local historian, um, has written a book, or not a book, has written an article in the Dublin Historical Record two years ago um, on the Rowe family and Rose Distillery, which makes interesting reading. This is an image of Nutley House, which is now the, um, the clubhouse for Elm Park Golf and Sports Club. And here Rowe entertained many distinguished visitors whose visits were recorded in the daily newspapers. And they included Queen Victoria when she was in Dublin for the great industrial exhibition of 1853, of which Rowe was chairman. He also entertained Daniel O'Connell at his home in Nutley. The Lord Lieutenant, um, the Lord Lieutenant in the 1850s, um, the Earl of St. Germans and the Countess St. Germans visited George Rose Domain at Nutley on more than one occasion for lunch and various receptions at which they, which were, excuse me, which again were reported in the national newspaper, like this one from the Freeman's Journal. Their Excellencies, the Lord Lieutenant and the Countess St. Germans spent three hours on Monday at Nutley with our fellow citizen, George Rowe Esquire, inspecting their garden and farm operations, with which they were much pleased. Their excellencies afterwards partook of refreshments and returned to the Vice Regal Lord Lodge at 5 p.m. George Rowe's domain at Nutley has been described as one of the finest domains in the County of Dublin. This in fact is a slide of one of of some of Rose's old farm buildings. So they would date from the 1850s and 60s. And they've been recently restored by Elm Park Golf and Sports Club. George Rowe engaged Ninian Niven, who was the director of the Botanic Gardens to design a garden, park, lake and tall Belvedere at Nutley. And the fountain that you can see there and the balustrades on the outside are all date from Rowe's time. He died in 1863. He had inherited two family distilleries which he amalgamated and the amalgamated distilleries became known, known as George Rowe and Co. It, as I've said already it was located in the Liberties. By 1887 it was considered one of the largest distilleries in Europe and when it finally closed in 1926, most of its buildings were demolished, but a few were incorporated into the Guinness Brewery and I believe are still in existence. Diageo, formerly Guinnesses, has in the last few years created a new whiskey known as Rowe and Co in, order, in honor of George Rowe. And it has turned the former Guinness powerhouse on Thomas Street into a new distillery called Rowe and Co. George's nephew, Henry Jr gave 230,000, which would have been 35 million in today's money, to pay for the restoration of Christchurch Cathedral and the building of a new Synod Hall. The confusion arises because was it his father or was it the son that gave the money, but apparently it was the son. The Guinness family apparently had paid for the restoration of St. Patrick's 
cathedral. So perhaps there was a certain amount of rivalry between two of the leading families in Dublin at the time. George Rowe was a member of the Church of Ireland and he was a liberal in politics. He supported Catholic emancipation. He was a justice of the peace and deputy lieutenant for the city of Dublin. He was a member of the Wide Streets Commissions for many years and was a member of a number of other public committees and organizations in the city. He became Lord Mayor of Dublin on, on the 1st of November, 1842, when he succeeded Daniel O'Connell. Suffering from ill health in the 1860s, which forced him to retire from business and his public offices. George Rowe and his wife moved to milder climates in the south of England. They lived in Torquay in Devon, where he died on the 20th of July, 1863, and his body was returned to Dublin for burial in Mount Jerome Cemetery. His funeral, which is one of the largest ever seen in Dublin, with the exception of Daniel O'Connell's funeral. There were about 400 carriages in the funeral procession from Lutley. In front of the procession walked 200 of the employees of Rowe & Co., the distillers, all wearing white scarves and headbands. Next came all the labourers employed at Nutley, who also wore scarves and headbands. As the cortege passed through Donnybrook, all the shops were closed and the local people stood in respect for their former benefactor. A fellow member of Elm Park History and Archives Committee and myself went up to Mount Jerome to see if we could find the Roe tomb, and we eventually found it. It was in very poor condition, as you can see from the image on the left. At my request, the tomb of George and Mary Rowe was restored and paid for by Diageo. And these are the images of the tomb, the two on the right, as they are today. You can't miss it, because if you're going to a funeral up at the Victorian chapel, you can see the, the uh, white marble um, tomb on the left. So you can't miss it really. So I hope you enjoyed this glimpse of some of the people in my new book, From the Grand Canal to the Daughter, Illustrious Lives. And my thanks to Aoife O'Tierney and the president and committee for their kind invitation to speak to you tonight about my new book, From the Grand Canal to the Daughter, Illustrious Lives. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Well, I just wanted to thank Beatrice very much and illustrious and eclectic, I think you could add into the mix as well to describe the people. There was a broad range of people there who lived in that part of Dublin. And uh, um, I'm just looking at the background now, now there to the picture, your picture. And you, you were saying that this was where George Rowe, this was his garden. That's right, yeah. yeah. The background yeah. in your picture, yeah. 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 And most interesting, I'll be most interested in reading the book because there were certainly interesting lives and interesting people, and you brought them to life wonderfully tonight for us, Beatrice. So thank, thank you. you very much for that. Sure. Now, if there's anybody who would like to ask a question, maybe William might be able to help you. Any questions? I think people are shy about asking questions on Zoom. They're much better asking the questions, Beatrice, up at the up at the Iona Centre. Right. Well, I can I can tell you something interesting. A friend yes. of mine, um, my friends um, have retired to um, uh, Aylesbury Road to one of the apartments there, and um, the husband was telling me that he'd gone through the book and picked out the places where people had lived and particularly around Aylesbury Road and Balls Bridge and he brought his grandchildren on a walk and told them you know I mean a lot of us mightn't have known that um, uh, John Boyd Dunlop who uh, who invented the uh, pneumatic tire spent uh, most of his life at 46 um, Aylesbury Road which is now which is now the Belgian embassy. Oh, imagine. Yeah. Which, uh, and I actually, my, my screen broke down halfway through it and I missed a bit of it, um, of it. And Frankie Byrne, of course, we all remember Frankie. Oh, and yes. Our, yes. <laughs> she, she was one of the, now, uh, Pather. Do you want to uh, ask something, Pather? 
Well, now you've asked me, <laughs> I didn't put my hand up, but no, uh, uh, a comment regarding you were saying about Brendan and Beatrice Bean. Yes. Uh, back in the late 50s, in fact, uh, 58, 59, it would have come out to Dawkey to go over to Dawkey Island to swim. Oh, really? they, they were both quite good swimmers, including him, probably maybe he just floated a bit. But uh, so interesting that the daughter should, in fact, be, as you said, uh, yeah. she yeah. said, and I can't remember the organisation, but she said that um, she said that that uh, there's some, I don't know, I think it's a veterans team or something. That's right. Yeah. And they have a big, yeah. they have a big um, a meeting, I think, once a year in Limerick. Uh, attached to there's a big swimming pool I think attached to the University of Limerick mm. and herself and her husband come over for that yeah yes they, they used yeah. to actually swim in the Dawkey end it they because Claire Small who's one of the veterans as well was from there and she would organize uh they, they'd have a swim on, on the dock which was quite tricky swimming I'm sure yes yeah thank you very much for the talk Peter. I Thanks. thought I thought it was a hoot that he Brendan turned up for the wedding without a best man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, wasn't just a surprise, though, <laughs> that he turned up without a best man. Yeah. That he turned up. <laughs> well, that might be the surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that he turned up. Anybody else that I just asked you, Padra, because your face appeared on my screen. Oh. That's, why, that's why. Well, I, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if there's anybody else, maybe you might, through William, who would like to ask a question. Because that's a very good idea, like to, to go to all the places where these people live to find them. That's an exercise in itself. I'm Frank Burke here. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, it was a fascinating talk altogether. I totally enjoyed it, Beatrice. Absolutely Thank you. Fascinating. Uh, Beatrice, just two observations. Beatrice Bean, I actually saw her in the Kishton in Cara Row, where I was working through relations before I went to university in 1966. Right. Uh, you mentioned that she was actually married, I think, March 65 to Brendan. She, no, she was married in January, I think it was. Right, well, it would have been within about a year, year and a half of when they actually saw her Sunday afternoon. I remember seeing her. She came in with a group of people uh, into the Kishton and Cara Row. Nice. And the other observation, which is brilliant, was uh, Muckley House. We had an American relative, distant relative, Colonel uh, Stuart Quagg, staying with us for a week in February 1998. And he was some way connected with Bernadette Grevy. And nice. I drove Stuart, God rest his soul, buried in Arlington Cemetery, full military honours and so on. I actually drove him down to Nutley House, where he was collected by uh, Bernadette Grevy's husband to be right. taken to Clontarf for lunch that day. And that was nice. February. Uh, uh, 1998. And you brought up so many memories. It's a wonderful talk. It must be a, w a wonderful book as well. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. Thank you, Beatrice. Yeah, these, these are only a sample, really, of all the wonderful talks, our, our pieces that um, Beatrice has in this book. How many, how many entries in all in the book? Well, there are 67, and it's an odd number, I know. And I started off and I thought, well, I'd have half and half, you know, but I was talking to a friend of mine and she said to me, well, you know, men were much more prominent than women. So maybe you should have a few more men than women. And in fact, I have. <laughs> more men than women in it. Well, you did well on the women, though, in it. I must yes. say. Yes. Um, I don't know. I, I, I know. I know that um, I gave a talk for the Balls Bridge, Donnybrook and Sandy Mount Society. And at that, some of the people in the audience were enthralled with the women. And they said, please, please do talk on the women of Dublin Four. So there was a history festival on in Dublin Castle. And I was asked, would I give the talk for Pembroke Library on the women of Dublin Four? And, yeah. and I think it's up on, um, it's on YouTube. I think it's Dublin History Festival, you have to look. Oh up. yeah, that would be, yeah. 
It was a great topic too you picked. Mm -hmm. How long yeah, you I, I can tell the book? I can tell you how it, how, how it came about. Um, I wrote two books on Donnybrook. The first one was called Donnybrook, the History. And I had very, you know, very, the last chapter in it was on people. And in fact, one of the people that I put in it was a school friend of mine called Lorna Madigan, who was head of presentation in RTE for many years. And she's, she was attending earlier. I don't know if she's still here. Are you still here, Lorna? And anyhow, um, I was asked. Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> oh, good. Well, they asked me, they asked me uh, what I'd like to write about next. And I said, well, I became very interested in the people who lived in Donnybrook and the, their representative in Dublin at the time, the history press is based in England. Um, and they said, um, sorry, now I've lost my trend. What was I going to say? They, they, they said, um, oh yes. They said, would you extend it to Dublin four, people from Dublin four? So that's how, that's how that came about. And then, I had a whole lot of Im images of different um, of different people that weren't used in the first book at all, and then I discovered that the History Press had um, had another series called Then and Now. So I said to them, "What about um, uh, Dublin Then and Now?" And they said, "Fine." So that's how the second one came about. Um, I, I, I'll tell you another thing. Um, which is, I suppose, interesting in a way. I had finished a PhD when I retired and I was up in Rathmines in Dubre bookshop and I picked up a local history of Rathmines, um, which was written by Morris Curtis. And some of you, if you're interested in local history, will know that the two Curtis brothers have written quite a few books <laughs> on different parts of Dublin. And I, I brought it home and read it. And my grandparents had lived in Renla and Rathmines. And I was absolutely fascinated by it. So what did I do? I wrote to the publisher and said, um, would, uh, had they got anyone lined up to, to write a history of Donnybrook? And if they haven't, you know, I would be interested in doing it. So that's how I, that's how it came about. Well, if there are no more uh, questions, we will uh, call the, the meeting to a close. And it was most interesting. And again, I would like to, to thank you, Beatrice, for giving us that beautiful and wonderful insight into all the interesting people who lived in that part of Dublin, Dublin 4. And again, I want to just thank William. And William, I hope that this is the last time we have to, to call on you. But every time we call on you, you come to the, our aid and help us out. And You're very welcome. Again. And we'll hope. And please hope God, we'll see you, see you back at the meetings. Yes. And I, I, I would like to thank him as well. He was very helpful to me um, as well. Thank you very much, William. You're, you're welcome, Beatrice. Yeah. So good night, everybody. See you all in March in the Iona Centre. Please, God. Thank you. Yeah. All the night. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.